As usual, Roy, the Minnesota Twins have provided plenty of reason to be optimistic if you're an optimist and plenty of reason to be pessimistic if you're a pessimist. Uh, here they are. They're, they're playing pretty well. They, they had a good homestand. They're in the playoffs uh, as of today. Uh, they're not far off from the division lead. They're going to be getting Royce Lewis back. They're going to have Brooks Lee available to him sometime soon. They also have some key players not playing particularly well. Where are you on the pessimist, optimist spectrum right now? I'm exceedingly optimistic because, and, and it falls directly on the on the pitching staff. I think they've far exceeded um, expectations, or at least uh, con- dire concerns. So teams generally play the way they pitch generally. And, uh, I mean, the, what we've been talking about for a while is playing out that the, the quality of the, of the bullpen, even with, you know, missing, you know, two guys that I consider to be really vitally important, uh, Brock Stewart and, uh, and Topa, I, I just think that, um, you know, you keep pitching the way you're pitching and you get their pitching and you got a chance, you know, real good, a real good chance. Uh, I I've said for a couple of months now, it's on the offense and we've pretty much seen that play out when the offense is good. Um, they win handily and when, uh, and excitingly, and when the offense is not good, they, they can't seem to buy a win. Uh, even though the pitchers have been, have been pretty good. So, uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, getting Royce Lewis back will help. I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, Byron Buxton will find it at some point in time and carry the club for for a bit. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of things to point to to say. Okay, um, you know, the, I, I think the offense is is. I still think the offense is good enough for this pitching staff. He's Roy Smalley, former Twin Star, current Twins broadcaster. I'm Jim Suhan from the Star Tribune. This is. Chin Music, our baseball show at TalkNorth.com. If you like the show, please subscribe to your favorite podcast app. It's free. It's the easiest way to listen. Check out all of our other shows at TalkNorth.com, the best sports lineup in town, lots of out, best outdoor lineup in town, variety, uh, all kinds of stuff, and we keep adding shows. Check it all out. We do appreciate it. We're coming to you from the Aquarius Home Services Studios, and we want to thank your boat club, Minnesota Masonic Charities, Twill in the Dining Galleria, and Chewy Vision Institute. Uh, Lavelle Neal might be joining us a little bit. I know he and I were at the Timberwolves game last night. But to start with Roy, uh, let's let's hit on one of your favorite subjects and probably uh, one of your favorite days to talk about these things. Two things jumped out at me on Thursday when they won the series against Kansas City. One was Jeffers being able to turn on a high fastball. I mean, yeah, we know he's big. We know he's strong. But I thought his hands were exceedingly quick on that pitch. Uh, hit a pitch that's hard to get to, and he knocks it over the left field fence. And the other one was Correa, clutch situation, bases loaded, lets the ball travel, smashes the ball to right field. Uh, almost a perfect example of what you always talk about in terms of intelligent hitting. Yeah, both of them really uh, impressive. Uh, <clears throat> Jeffers started off uh, very hot, was ca- carrying the club to some degree, and then uh, just kind of lost it. And it, it happens um uh, with hitters it, it doesn't matter who you are <laughs> you're gonna every year you're gonna go through some streaks where it's you know how did I do that again <laughs> and to see him come back now in big fashion uh, he's had a good week or so uh, since uh, you know kind of breaking out of the slump you know, to see him come back and then to your point uh, to get to a high fastball, uh, like he did, really encouraging. Uh, he's got really good about <clears throat> now about uh, where he is again. And of course, Correa. Um, I don't. I, I guess we can't overstate how bad his uh, his heel was last year. He's doing things at shortstop, and he's having at bats that look totally different. And um, he is a veteran hitter and one of the few guys that will uh, concede to a pitcher enough to wait and let the ball travel and hit the ball the other way. And uh, again, it's, 
you know, you just kind of look at the rest of the club and say, um, this is how you do it. And uh, uh, Kepler has done that a bit. I mean, there's there's some signs of optimism, but, you know, up and down the lineup, there's some troublesome spot, spots, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about. But, uh, you know, for those two guys to uh, basically carry the club to um, – those two guys in the bullpen to carry the club, you know, to a, to a win, that's um, – that's 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 good stuff. No doubt. Uh, Brandon Morton's our producer today. Again, check out talknorth.com. And uh, I guess this might sound backwards, but one of the reasons I'm optimistic about this team and where it is right now is we haven't seen the best from Pablo mm-hmm. Lopez. We haven't seen the best from Byron Buxton. They've only had one inning of Royce Lewis. They haven't had Brooks Lee available to them. Topa hasn't given them anything yet. Brock Stewart's been on the injured list. Uh, Duran has been less than his usual uh, dominant self. I mean, there's so much upside from the best players on this roster that they could put this team over the top. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a mean reversion coming. Um, it, it, it's uh, it hasn't been really pronounced the other way. Well, I suppose it has uh, with, with uh, you know with Buck. Uh, it's been it's been a couple of months now of him not being. Uh, his explosive self at, at the plate. Um, and I, I think that um, Royce Lewis is going to take a while to get back in the groove. I, I mean, I say that. You never know what that kid and what he's right. able to do when he's, when he's on the stage, on a big stage. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, I think that um, – and then, the, you know, the bullpen arms that you mentioned uh, either are not pitching as well as, as normal. I, I think there's a lot of um, mean – the upside that uh, that we can, that I think that we're we're going to see. I am a little concerned about Duran. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's a little troublesome to watch that stuff go up there and and not be not be dominating. But I think they'll figure that out too. Yeah, and uh, one one area of concern that I'm not sure is just going to work itself out is Julian has been in a slump for a while now. And, you know, I kind of thought he had the kind of approach with his patience, ability to go the other way, that he might be a little more slump proof than your average young player. Uh, but he is he's he's fighting it right now. Do you think he can figure it out while in the big leagues? You know, I think it's it's going to be tough. I mean, the, I, the answer is, you know, a definite maybe um, he's, he's got a lot of talent to hit. He's. Uh, not looking like himself, and and the thing that's troubling, you know, troubling uh, about Julian is we know how good an eye at the plate he has. He knows the strike zone, and yet uh, he's you know taking strike three on breaking balls that are right in the heart of the plate, and uh, he's take he's missing some fastballs right in the heart of the plate. So uh, there's something there's something wrong, and it could be you know just like. Uh, Jeffers uh, earlier where you just kind of forget how you did it and he will work his way out. I hope that's the case. Uh, sometimes you need to have a little reset. Um, and what I think if I, I, I think it, 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 with Royce Lewis coming back and if Brooks Lee were just were playing and killing it in AAA, I think it would be um, a, a, probably a, an issue for, uh, for Julian. But, you know, until – they figure out what they're going to, how they're going to, you know, play Royce and who's going to play where, um, and then br- until Brooks Lee starts swinging it, I think, I, you know, I think they need him to Julian to figure it out, and uh, so they're going to give him every opportunity to, you know, have this be like I just said about Jeffers, every every hitter going through stuff where you forget how you did it, and, I'm, and it, the, the difference for me is is the pitches that he's taking for strike three and that it and that speaks to the fact that i thought he had a good two strike approach uh with his ability to hit the ball in left field to the opposite field up the middle of the opposite field haven't seen that and um that's a little that's a little troubling yes uh hey lavelle's with us now we were just talking about the fact that roy and i are pretty bullish on this team we feel like they've hung in there even while 
having some key injuries, having some key players not perform the way we think they're capable of. I, I sense, Lavelle, that you're a little more worried about this club right now. Yeah, I, I am. I am worried about the about the club. And I mean, I I, I, mean, I think that things can turn around. Definitely, I think they could be a, a more consistent offense. And we haven't seen the best of Pablo, but I'm looking at the the the, the, the Guardians and the Royals in the division this year. And, you know, uh, this is like the toughest division. I looked it up. You know, I'm not counting 2020 because that's a weird season. But this this could be the first time the divisions had three teams at or above 500 since 2016. And um, this looks like it's going to be a little more competitive than it's been in recent years. That's why I'm getting a little concerned about the Twins being able to turn things on like they did a year ago. Because I think the resistance is going to be a little uh, more pronounced here. Um you know, good sign taking three or four from Kansas City, uh, but I don't. I don't know. Uh, we got so many guys that haven't gotten the bats going, and, and it's like this is the second year that we've seen this early in the season. Um, Royce is close to coming back, and give props to Royce because you know we had I had heard things about him not coming back until All Star break. It looks like he's going to beat that, uh, but when he comes back, and this plays into them sticking with Julian a little bit longer because. Rocco's already worried about his lineup being imbalanced because of all the right-handed hitters. He's he uh, told us last week that um, you know he's, he, don't be surprised if Buxton bats seventh a couple of times um, just to kind of space things out. So they need the lefties like and Kepler. I get Kepler credit too because at this time last year I think we we're all screaming for him to be DFA and he's actually been uh, decent at the plate. But um, the consistency with the offense, um, being able to build a lineup. When uh, your best your best player Royce Lewis has been out, you know it's been challenging, and maybe uh, I'm sure there'll be a boost when he returns. But man, I just look at the Royals, and I talked to a Twins coach before yesterday's game. He said Kansas City may be better than Cleveland, um, which uh, was a little bit surprising to hear. But I just think they're going to have to pack a lunch a little, a little this year uh, to win this division. I want to talk. Go ahead, Roy. Oh, oh I, I mean. I, I'm sorry, Ray. I thought I thought I heard you you popping in. Yeah, no, I mean it's, it's my mental telepathy. It's just it, it's just <laughs> better. And better. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean I I hear what um, Lavelle's saying, and uh, don't disagree with the assessment. Uh, but I just think that I think the mean reversion that we were talking about is uh, a, a little bit earlier is is. Uh, it, 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 and um, I, I think there, there's a lot of I mean, the as good as Kansas City. Everybody says Kansas City is for them. You know, the Twins have, have haven't played, you know, great baseball. They've been okay, but then, then the, you know this vaunted Kansas City club comes in. And the Twins take three out of four. I think that's a big deal. Agreed. By the way, my band's playing at a musical festival, LTD Brewing in Hopkins. Uh, their tenth anniversary party. 3.30 to 4.30 on Saturday. That's tomorrow. Uh, check it out if you get a chance. They always have a big crowd. It's always a blast. Uh, we want, want to remind you, we're coming to you from the Aquarius Home Services Studios, and we want to thank your boat club. Got the winter blues? Start planning your summer. Plan on fun and get out in the water with your boat club. Your boat club offers boat club memberships and daily rentals with access to over 40 bodies of water and over 400 brand new boats to enjoy. Whether you want to cruise on a pontoon, create waves in a speedboat, or reel in a big one on a fishing boat, your boat club has got you covered. Unlimited boating memberships are available now, starting at just $1.99 a month after a one-time initiation. Life is better on the water. Find out more today at yourboatclub.com. Thanks also to Minnesota Masonic Charities. When people think of the Freemasons, they often think of secret handshakes and unusual hats, and of course, the pancake breakfast. Minnesota Masonic Charities would prefer that you think about the work that they do right here in our community. Places like the Masonic Cancer Center at the University of Minnesota or the Masonic Children's Hospital and the Masonic Home in Bloomington. They are just a few examples of the important work that the Freemasons support here in Minnesota. As part of the largest fraternal organization in the world, Masons have consistently answered the call when it comes to charitable needs. We look forward to learning so much more about their many programs here in the weeks to come. 
Reminder, Twill in the Dining Gallery, a Scott Dayton shop, still the best men's clothing store in Minnesota. Uh, sign up for their email alerts at twillmn.com. They will not spam you. They'll just let you know when they have events. They have a lot of events. They've had Samuelson to their, to their brands. Uh, just traveling with the Timberwolves lately, pretty much everything I wore was like Brax or Johnny O or Peter Millar. Uh, I wore, basically, I was dressed in, if I looked decent, it was because I was dressed from head to toe in stuff I got at Twill. They also have graduation presents, golf stuff, fine, everything from golf shorts to fine Italian suits. Uh, you get it there, twillmn.com. Also want to thank one of our newer sponsors across the network, Choi Vision Institute. Yeah, Choi Vision Institute in Bloomington. I was there um, just the, earlier this week to get uh, a consultation for LASIK surgery. Found out I'm a great candidate for it. And super easy to set up an appointment, go in there. They run you through a bunch of tests. Their people are very nice. And they will give you a straight up and honest answer for your options for uh, for your vision correction. And I am looking forward to having LASIK at, at Chew Vision once the playoffs are over. So go to chewvision.com to set up your appointment and uh, you won't be disappointed at all. Great people at Chew Vision. So what's the level of concern with Duran? Uh, Roy mentioned Duran earlier. Lavelle, what are you seeing from him right now? I don't know. It seems like he's in between. Um, his uh, break is off, isn't that sharp, and his control's off. Um, and I... You know, I don't know if that outcome, the situation in Washington when the, uh, he said I was ordered to throw that pitch, I don't know if that's led to some more discussion slash confusion over what his pitch selection is. Um, I'm thinking that when you're in doubt, throw 102, you know, and and to figure out and then kind of go from there Well, with him. But it was never smooth sailing with him last year either. Um, he led a runner or two on. I think I think we – we see the 103 mile an hour fastball and the breaking ball. And you're like, this guy's going to carve up uh, opposing lineups. But um, no, th it, that wasn't the case last year for a, a stretch of the season where um, he had company on the bases and had to kind of work around that. I'm not saying he's become Eddie Gordado and likes a little the bases before he gets out of issues. But, you know, he, usually there's been a runner or two. And there's times where, you know, he's trying to be unpredictable. And he throws a breaking ball up there, and, and teams are, like, celebrating that. They're like, thank God, don't throw it 102 mile off fastball. I'll take the curveball. Thank you. So um, it's just a matter of him settling into a groove. Um, like I said, when in doubt, just go with the, the country fastball and, you know, see if he can get on the stre stretch here. But he was up and down last year, too, and I think last year turned out okay for him. Yeah, so even a guy with that kind of stuff, I mean, let's – Let's face it, 102 and a splitter, splinker thing that he throws 95 that, that goes down hard and a great, a lot of bite on, on his curveball. I mean, that's even for a guy that has three really impressive pitches uh, like those three, I, I go back to he's no different than every other pitch. And location matters. It, it really matters. It matters more than pitch selection. And um, he has, I, I think the next thing is to have some kind of feel for all three of those pitches about throwing them where he wants to or missing just off away from the middle of the zone when he misses. And, you know, guys are guys are going up there Looking for 102, some guys, you know, it just they, they square it up once in a while. I mean, that, that happens. It's when he throws it in the middle of the plate, even though it's 102, there's there are, these are big league hitters that sometimes square it up. That curveball, and they love his curveball. They and um, it, the thing that bothers me is is that he pitches like they the Twins uh, pitching uh, coaching. Like they're afraid that somebody might hit a fastball, so let's throw something else. And I'm with Labelle. I mean, when you throw 102, uh, that's a that's a weapon. And he goes lots of at bats without showing 102 up around a guy's eyes somewhere to you know to kind of get their attention. And and so I'll, I just come back to but location because he doesn't really know where the curveball is going. He's throwing from the middle of the plate. 
and a guy's looking for 102, and they get a they get a curveball in the middle of the plate. Uh, Lavelle is right; they they got a chance. And the splitter that he's got, I think, uh, should be used as a strike three or ground ball, or you don't throw it. His in like manner, when guys are looking for a hundred or a hundred two, and they get ninety five in the middle of the plate with, with that splitter, and in the middle of the plate, it doesn't sink that much. Uh, they're going to be on that. I mean, that's it's like thank you. Uh, the splitter that starts knee high and breaks below, or or just below thigh high and breaks to the knees with, with that's where the downward uh, break is 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 really really good then you know that's you have to be able to throw it it all three of those pitches have some kind of idea about where they're going and he may be more importantly where they're not going to go and um you know he he's not quite there yet he's got this raw uh, ability to have three plus plus pitches he's not he's not plus yet in control in the strike zone and can control of what, where he wants to throw some of these. So that's, I think, next step for him. And it's on top of everything else you said, and I think you, you mentioned this, Roy, but just to emphasize it, that's how good modern major league hitters are. They can hit 102, 104 if they're looking for it and it's not in a great location. It's the ultimate testament to just how well trained the modern hitter is. Well, that's really true, and and uh, that's and so it's understandable why they the, the you know the manager and the pitching coach see that that breaking ball bite going up there and they go, man, I mean, why would it, these guys can hit fastball, but they can't hit that. There's no way they can hit that uh, consistently. But we've seen it happen. We saw it happen twice in Cleveland. And then the the other side of that is, you know, if you go ball two with a couple of curveballs because you're afraid, to, if you were afraid of them hitting a the fastball before, when it's two and zero oh and you've missed with two straight breaking balls, I think you need to be a little concerned about them hitting the fastball and be a little more concerned. So, you know, it, it's it, 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 any any catcher uh, will tell you, and as standing out at shortstop and and watching as long as I did from. Very close range, and now watching center field camera uh, all, all the time. I mean, it, any all of us will say, "Yeah, I might have thrown something different there and that." But if you'd thrown it in the place where you really wanted to throw it, it wouldn't have made a difference which pitch it was. If with the, with the Rand's case too, he's probably still learning here. When do you just challenge hitters, and when do you become unpredictable? Um, because trust me, if a hitter is swinging a hundred mile on fastball, it means he's expecting a fastball. What moments do you go away from that, and what moments do you stay with the country hard fastball? I think that's part of the learning process for Duran. See, you're right, Lavelle. And and the thing about it is, okay, a hitter's coming up and it's in a big situation, or even even lead off the lead off the inning. So everybody has got 102. So are you just are you going to pitch normally and just say look I'm throwing fastballs till I get to two strikes cuz I can't hit it and then I'm going to throw you know one or both of my other ones with two strikes. That gets predictable. Uh guys be sitting on fastball early. Uh but uh the the flip side of that is at some point in time early in the count you have got to get a hitter's attention with how much velocity you have. And uh, so it's it again. I'm back to location because if you can throw strike one in a good spot with a uh, with a fastball, then you can do just about anything. If you throw strike one with a curveball in a good spot, then that fastball looks you know really really good again. So it's it really is about um, you know it's about location and it's about being able to know who the hitter is. And I think this is what you were saying, Lavelle, and I agree. Knowing who the hitter is, I mean, there. Yes, big league hitters can catch up with uh, with big league fastballs. There aren't a lot of left-handed hitters that can do what Jeffers did yesterday and turn around a, a ninety-five mile an hour fastball up in this or in. And to the you know to the degree, I mean, the left-handed hitter goes up there. You know, you're doing a favor if you, if you throw a breaking ball that looks good and it breaks down to their swing zone in the bottom half part of the strike zone. 
rather than upstairs and saying you can't you can't hit this. So yeah, location is important, and it also depends on okay who's the hit, who's the hitter and how do how am I gonna how am I gonna have him confused and concerned about the three plus pitches I have? What am, what are, what's my sequence gonna be? Let's get uh, one more good topic in here today, guys. Uh, Ryan Jeffers. Right now, I think he's about 16th uh, in the in MLB in OPS, and that's for a catcher. Um, what's the upside? Uh, I mean, I, I I don't know that people are as excited about this guy as maybe they should be. Lavelle, what's the upside for Ryan Jeffers? I think there's plenty of upside there. That, uh, but. The interesting thing about how catchers are used today, you don't have too many horses anymore. You don't have any Yadier Molinas. You don't have any Salvi Perez's who are catching 130, 148 games. It's more of a timeshare. And the Twins are doing that now. I mean, I think part of it is because they're paying Vasquez $10 million a year, and they figured they got to get some, get some usage out of him. Um, but, you know, Vasquez playing every other day or playing two three two times a week allows the Jeffers to be fresh so he can do damage at the plate and hit as a DH. Um, I think you're seeing a guy who, you know, what, two years ago, overhauled his swing, started from the scratch, and he's got um, he's got a better swing path. He, uh, he he trusts his hands, and, you know, he's destroying baseballs right now. And, yeah, you're right. Um, offensive catcher can never be undervalued. Um, I think that's why, you know, Joe Mara's greatness can never be over overrated because there was a year in which he was the modern Triple Crown winner. He uh, led the league in batting average, on base percentage, and slugging percentage. Um, that's just crazy for a catcher to achieve, and it can't be it can't be overlooked enough. So what Jeffers doing has done, and he also shows that he can make adjustments. So even if he falls in a little bit of a slump, he could, he'll probably figure out a way to get out of it too. So I, you know, I I don't know I don't see why Jeffers can't you know hit like twenty five or more homers a year and drive in eighty runs. Um, playing 120 times or so a season, or uh, if you DH, just maybe get another 15 to 20 appearances like that. Um, so yeah, um, if you have an offensive catcher, man, first of all, lock him up and and, and just enjoy the production because a lot of teams are struggling to find that from their catchers. I think the upside, I agree, and I think the upside will be this. I, I think it will be a decrease in the really, really bad 0 for 20 or whatever he was uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Through, the, through the Washington series when it was clear that his whole tempo was uh, to left field. And his swing, he, he, he was way out in front of breaking balls, and then that bothered him. He was trying to you know, wait back a little longer, and he'd get jammed by fastballs that he should have hit. And everybody, as I said before, and we'll say again uh, ad infinitum, that, that everybody goes through uh, tough times. And he will have another one, as will everybody else. But his ability to choke up and hit the ball to right field with two strikes, uh, he got away from that. And uh, when he started swinging it well again, it started out with, with that with his ability to hit the ball to, you know, to right field in a situation where he has to, had to protect the plate. I, I think to the degree that he stays with that and his ability to do that with two strikes will lead to, okay, I think this guy's going to throw me breaking balls or, and so I'm going to look for fastball away. If I, if I want to stay on the fastball speed, I'm going to look away and try to hit the ball to right center. And that will keep him on breaking balls. I think that was the next in the in the progression for him because I think he has the ability to do that. He's shown a bit of a willingness to do that. And I think if he comes to believe it, then you know, there there's real real big upside. I mean, I think the I think we're already seeing upside. We're looking at you know what he did you know last year and that and now backing that up so far pretty much and. So I think we've already seen upside, and this would be just the way he is. Will be you know plenty good enough for a catcher to Lavelle's point. But the next, if he makes the next step, the next line in this, you know, step in this progression to you know the you know the right field, right center field approach, or the 
this guy's going to throw me a lot of breaking balls. I'm just going to sit on it. You know, so that little adjustment is next. And if he makes that, I, I really don't, I, I don't know how, how big the upside is, but it's, it's exciting. Hey, Roy, if you are a, uh, sorry, Jim, uh, Roy, if you are uh, in scouting and development and you're looking at catching prospects for the draft, are you looking for a guy who's catch first and hoping that he can figure out things at the plate? Or are you looking for a hitter who probably needs his catching skills honed? I'm leaning kind of toward the latter. You know, it just, it, it just really depends uh, on, uh, on the guy. I think that I, I think they should be looking for guys that can hit um, your uh, point about Joe Maurer is, is the great one because it, to get that kind of production from catcher, you put a lineup together and you say, okay, I want two of my three outfielders at least to be run producers. And I want production from first and third. And that's pretty much it. I mean, to, so if you get production from anywhere else, then it's a gigantic bonus and, or it's a big bonus. If you get a Joe Maurer, of course, it's a gigantic you know, bonus. And I think they've got a bonus Jeffers because I think he's good enough behind the plate uh, to combine with that, uh, with that offense. Agreed. Um, but I, but I do think you have to, you have to look at the guy and make some determination. I mean, I, I think they should lean toward offense, but I think you can, if a guy's, you know, big and athletic, then, and he throws, you know, he throws, okay. I think he can learn an awful lot about, about how to catch in the big leagues. If a guy's a really good defensive catcher. And I mean, I think you can tell pretty early. On, yeah. I mean, I think he's defense only. So I, that that's how you make that decision. Good stuff, gentlemen. I appreciate it. It's going to be an interesting season. Uh, we'll continue to uh, discuss whether we should be pessimistic or optimistic as they, we go week by week here. I remain bullish on this team, and I'm really looking forward to watching Royce Lewis play again. So for Brandon Morton, Royce Smalley, Lavelle Neal, I'm Jim Stuhan, and this is TalkNorth.com.